Welcome to another Spurs video. I'm Ashley Miller, and today we are very lucky to be joined by Davida Charney, a professor of rhetoric here at UT Austin. She's going to be talking with you about stasis theory. Thank you. I'm very glad to be here talking to you about this. Stases are claims. Uh, stasis theory is about a series of claims that each side in a debate wants to prove about a problem or a solution. They're helpful because they follow a sensible order, they apply to arguments in every discipline, profession, and public forum, and they help writers decide how much space and time to give to various points. So there's five kinds of stases, five types, existence, definition, value, cause, and action. And you'll see that this order makes some sense as we see, look at some examples. So the first one is existence, which is an argument about whether an object really exists or if something really happened. The definition uh, stasis is not a dictionary definition. It's actually an argument about what kind of object or event it is that exists. A value argument is about how good or bad the event is or the object is, if it's dangerous or expensive, whether it's ethical or unethical. The cause stasis is about what caused this event, what brought it about, or what might prevent it. And the action uh, stasis is what should be done about it. Uh, maybe who should do it, when it should happen, and so on. So here's an example of uh, the stasis in use in a criminal case, uh, which is where the theory of stasis actually originated. So let's say that Amy accuses Bill of stealing her bicycle. So the first argument that she would have to make is that she has a bicycle, that the same bicycle is now in Bill's possession. So you have to establish that something happened. Uh, at the definition stasis, Amy would have to argue that it's a theft, while Bill might describe this transfer as a sale, or a gift, or a loan, or something that he found on the street. At the value stasis, Amy would argue that the bike is very valuable, and Bill might argue that it was just a junker and not worth very much. At the level of cause, uh, you, this is where Amy would have to argue that it was Bill who stole the bike. And as, in, as you see in CSI TV shows all the time, the basic arguments under cause are means, motive, and opportunity. And at the level of action, uh, Amy would argue about whether Bill should be tried uh, in court or whether this should be negotiated or mediated. If he's a juvenile, maybe it belongs in family court. So that's one uh, example from the uh, law domain. Uh, we can now take a look at another example in the policy domain. So imagine that Calvin is writing an argument about how his school can prevent bullying. So the first thing Calvin might argue is, uh, does bullying happen in our school? And what kind of events count as bullying? Or what are the aspects of bullet, what are the kinds of cases that he's concerned about? Is it physical fighting or insults? Um, he might need to argue that it's uh, fighting is, uh, is not just joking around. Uh, he might have to argue that it's very frequent or dangerous at the level of value. The level of cause is probably the most important aspect. He would have to argue uh, what's causing uh, the bullying, whether it's just a few bad individuals or whether there's a clique that's bullying other students. Uh, maybe it, it'll make a difference whether the bullying is on race, religion, or gender. Um, whether it's due to uh, teachers not paying attention. So there might be a lot of action at the cause level. And finally, uh, who should take action? So Calvin might want to make a, a full argument about what he, he would like to see happen to prevent bullying. So once you uh, uh, have your stasis laid out, what you need to do is, is use them to decide where to put the most explanation, reasons, and evidence. The idea behind this is that claims that are agreed on, if both sides agree on a claim, you don't have to spend much time talking about that claim. 
But if one side stops to debate a point, then that's where the speaker needs to try and gain agreement by providing more explanation and reasons and evidence um, before moving on to the next stasis. So the bottom line is that the most time and space in a talk or a paper goes to the most controversial points. If we go back to the example, um, maybe nobody would really dispute the idea that bullying is happening in the school, so Calvin might just need to mention it. But his, uh, one of his major points might be um, whether it's fighting that counts as bullying, whether just sending text messages counts as bullying, and so uh, there might be some controversy there, and so Calvin might want to spend a lot of time on that one. So um, the idea is that you want to anticipate, as the writer, which points your audience will find controversial and use that to decide where to spend the time and space uh, in your uh, paper or your speech. Uh, finally, what's next, once you understand what the stases are, uh, you can find them in all kinds of different uh, persuasive pieces, in op-eds, in um, magazine articles, uh, any place you might look for, in blogs, any place you might look for a, an argument. And the best uh, thing to do is to take a look at a whole paragraph, or me maybe even a whole section, and ask, well, is this whole thing really about value? Uh, or is it really all about cause? and try to study them as you see them, and look for how claims of different stasis are developed. So uh, claims at the level of value are going to have a lot of value terms in them, and why they're important, why they're unimportant, how important they are, which will be very different from a cause claim, which might develop kind of as a, a narrative, first this happened and then that happened, and so on. So there's a lot to look into uh, in how to develop claims at different stases. And finally, the stases are very useful to use as a rough outline when you're writing your own argument. Thank you.